Shalom. This week's parasha is Parashat Naso. Uh, we are introduced uh, to a passage that began with the previous parasha. For whatever reason, our minhag is to divide up this particular narrative between two weeks. In Bamidbar, we read about the census, the sort of census of the Jewish people, and about how they were instructed to encamp around the Mishkan. And then we read about a similar census that was taken of the Levites. And then we were told about the jobs of the particular Levite families. And we are continuing with that because uh, last week left off, we talked about the Bnei Kahat, uh, one of Levi's sons. His part of the tribe of Levi was in charge of moving the Kalim of the Mishkan, the implements that were used in the Mishkan. For example, the Ark of the Covenant and the other important Kalim, which were mostly made out of gold, in the case of the altar made out of copper and all the individual smaller kilim which, was, which were used in the service. And everything that the Bnei Kehat carried in the Jewish people's travels was done uh, by shoulder. That is, most of the things they carried had staves that they put on their shoulders, and even those things which did not, for example, a number of the smaller kilim and the menorah itself, were put on wooden boards which had staves on them, and they carried those. And of course everything was covered, and it can be reasonably expected that many of these things were particularly heavy, and there were enough Kohanim, hundreds of them, uh, at any particular time, only a few dozen were actually doing this because they were rotating in and out. Uh, things could not be carried for a certain long time. Well, the sages said, for example, that the Ark of the Covenant basically carried itself, but when we deal with, let's say, the menorah and the shulchan, and uh, that was the sh t table for the showbread, and the golden altar, we're talking about things that were made mostly out of gold, so they could be quite heavy, and there was a rotation. Here we're talking about now the other tribal families, and once again, their job was to dismantle the mishkan and carry the individual pieces. The, we read about how uh, the two other groups, Bnei Gerishom, the children of Gershom and Mirari, had at their disposal wagons, large wagons, which were used to carry the boards of the Mishkan, which those were already too large and cumbersome for people to just carry on their shoulders. And this is unique to the role of the Levites. The role of the tribe of Levi had basically evolved. Let us start at the beginning of history. Uh, right when the Levites were chosen, that they were told that they're going to do the work of the Oa Moed. Literally, they do the grunt work. They're the ones who take apart the Mishkan and transport it and put it back together wherever the Jewish people encamp. And it says that they serve, but it's very unclear from the Psukim. It's, not, it's only by the oral tradition we know what the Levi'im would do later in Temple times. In temple times, uh, we read about how the Levi'im were in charge of singing in the Mishkan and in the Mikdash. The Kohanim did the work on the altar, that is, they dealt with the animal sacrifices, anything that had to be burned, and the incense, etc. And the Levi'im would sing. Their job was to sing during the offering of the libations that accompanied the public sacrifices. And the Levim also acted as honor guard in the temple and as the gatekeepers. I'm going to ask how many Levim can keep the gates already? How many of them can be on an honor guard? The answer is they needed very few at any particular moment, even though there might have been hundreds of Levim, but this is their privilege. And this is the way it was throughout temple times. We read about how explicitly, it's in the Mishnah and also in the book of Chronicles, Devarayamim, that King David and those who were with him divided Levim into particular groups and also the Kohanim, uh, as, but they're not the, the subject today. They divided Levim into particular groups and they were on rotation when they would serve in the temple and also apparently David, as the final composer of the book of Psalms, also established with his prophetic friends how and when the songs would be sung in the temple. He is the one who established what we know as the Shir Shalyom, the particular songs that Levi'im would sing on particular occasions. And once again, what groups they were part of when a group of Levi'im would actually serve in the temple and be in charge of the singing. Also, the Levi'im were the ones playing the musical instruments in the temple, which is very important. Technically speaking, Israelites who had proper uh, impeccable lineage, that is that their families could marry into the Kohanic families, were also given this privilege of playing musical instruments in the temple. 
but the main job fell to the Levites, and only the Levites could actually sing with their voices. And that is actually the standard. How do you know a Levi is already too old to continue serving? It's because he already is, he, he can't sing well anymore, and instead he goes back to guard duty or gatekeeper duty. And that is the permanent role as described by the sages of the Levi. So th obviously they cannot do the task they used to do in the desert, which was taking apart the sanctuary and transporting it, because once the temple was built, it was never meant to be taken apart or transported elsewhere. Uh, we also saw uh, some time ago that the Rishonim are unclear as to who exactly transports the Ark of the Covenant. It seems from some Rishonim, uh, the Rambam if I'm not mistaken, that really the job was given to the Kohanim and the Levi'im uh, by just because the first generation there were very few Kohanim, the Levim had the job of transporting the Ark of the Covenant. But other Rishonim say if you actually look in the various verses when it talks about the transportation thereof, sometimes it was Levim, sometimes it's Kohanim, sometimes it's unclear who it was. And apparently both could have done it. So is there a halachic principle for who was actually in charge? Why do I say this? Even though they eventually stopped moving the, the, the Mishkan around, taking it apart and moving it around to different places. The Ark of the Covenant, unfortunately, was moved. It was moved around a lot in, in early history. King David himself had trouble bringing it to Jerusalem. And apparently, sometime later in history, as the this destruction approached, uh, there's a, an approach in, that in the Mishnah that, uh, and in the Gemara that the Ark of the Covenant was removed. Apparently it was hidden by the Levim, that's the way the, the Rambam has it, and others say it was actually taken captive. But it, it did leave the temple at some point. I always like the explanation that really the Kohanim are in charge of moving the Ark of the Covenant when it, has, when it actually involves in going into the temple or going out. So, for example, when the Jews would travel in the desert, it says explicitly in last week's Parsha that it was first covered with the parochet by the Kohanim. That's how they would enter it. They would grab the, the curtain that separated between the Holy of Holies and the, and the outer chamber, the Holy, just the Holy Chamber, and they'd grab the parochet and they would walk toward the Aron and cover it. Because the parochet is the divider between the Kodesh and the Kodesh Kodeshim. So when the Mishkan is constructed, it divides between the two rooms. And when it's time to take apart everything, <coughs> it actually covers the Ark and keeps the Kodesh Kodeshim restricted to the area that's underneath this cover. They would cover it, and then the Levim would carry it. And later in history, when they had to move the Ark for whatever reason, it would be the Kohanim who go into the Holy of Holies and remove the Ark. And then they would put it down. And then when it would have to go long distance, the Levi'im would be the ones who would take it there. And apparently that's how they brought it to the temple for its final journey. When it was brought to the temple, it had originally been in a elaborate tent that King David set up in what was his city, the Ir David. And the Kohanim removed it from that tent, and then the Levim brought it up to the entrance of the temple in preparation for the inauguration uh, ritual that we read about in King Solomon's time. And then the Kohanim themselves brought the Ark of the Covenant into the temple. And then they walked out. And that was the last time they moved it until they had to hide it. Once again, Kohanim physically removed it from the Holy of Holies, and from there the Levim took over. And unfortunately, we live in a time that's been uh, taking a little bit too long where there no longer is a temple service, and now the Levim are apparently out of a job. But that's not so true, because more importantly, the Levim and the Kohanim have the job of teaching the Torah to the rest of the Jewish people. And the Rambam actually says this, even before he describes the Levitic duties with regards to the temple, he describes the Levitic duties outside the temple. That is, the Levites are to dedicate themselves to teaching God's Torah. And their blessing from their father, certainly not a curse, or their tikkun that they received from Yaakov Avinu was that they would be scattered among the Jewish people. There's no particular area, like we saw last week, there's a defined area of the land of Israel that belongs to the tribe of Zivulun. There's a defined area of the land of Israel that belongs to the children of Yehuda. There is no such place of the tribe of Levi. Yes, they have their small cities, which, by the way, today would be called neighborhoods. The Levites had a town here and there, scattered among, scattered equally among the tribes, uh, and including this also is the Kohanim. The Kohanim are a subgroup of the Levim, so they get their own towns also. They're scattered among their people because their job is to influence the Jewish people to be good and to follow God's way and to teach them. And indeed, the sages said that really the Sanhedrin had to have members of whom were Levim and also Kohanim. 
that was a necessary component, uh, the ingredients in the Sanhedrin. You need the Kohanim and Levim to teach the Jewish people. And the Rabbah further says that other people who dedicate their lives to avoiding the materialistic uh, tendencies that there are, or following uh, what other people follow, the usual things that people waste their time, he dedicates himself to God's service, he raises himself up to be like a Levi. Doesn't mean he can demand tithes from everybody or that the community support him because he's one of God's servants, but it does mean that God gives him a promise that he will be supported if he takes care of himself. That is, if he trusts in God sufficiently and he just does the minimum necessary. Uh, and there are people, even today, who take upon this code of, uh, uh, this Levitic code or this Levitic uh, vow that they will not benefit from this world more than necessary so that they can dedicate themselves to the study of Torah and the teaching of Torah. What else we learn from this is that the, those who study the Torah have to be teachers of the Torah. It's not sufficient for someone just to say, I'm going to study these, uh, these volumes of the Talmud and keep it to myself. One of the requirements, like Moshe Rabbeinu himself did, he taught the Torah, and for free also. If one acquires much Torah, it is not his. It's not his to save up in the bank. It's not his to put in the safe. It's not his to try to hide away and hoard from others. The Torah that one possesses is not his possession. Yes, he's acquired much Torah, and that Torah requires of him to then pass it on to others. And that's what the Levim do. They would make themselves repositories of the Torah, the keepers of the tradition, and they would become the teachers of the Torah. Even more so, they would become the defenders of the Torah. And this is alluded to in Moshe Rabbeinu's blessing, which is undoubtedly a blessing to the tribe of Levi. He predicted that one day in the future, the Levim, specifically the Kohanim, would rise up and defend Judaism from those who would seek to destroy it. And he, he, this is, has its precedence, for example, in the incident of the Golden Calf, when it was the Levim who were, took upon themselves to punish the evildoers and joined with Moshe Rabbeinu eradicating whatever pieces of idolatry had infected the, the nation. And later in Hasmonean times, the, the revolution against the, both the, the Hellenists and the Hellenizers and the Greeks themselves were led by, of course, groups of Kohanim who eventually saved uh, Judaism as we know it, led to an independent uh, land of Israel, and the reinstitution of the temple services. And God willing, perhaps that's how it's going to work out also in the coming future. Once again, the Levites will show us the way, and with their influence, we will be able to reachieve that which we have lost in this uh, uh, in the last few centuries. Uh, I wish everybody, uh, of course, a Shabbat Shalom. And this week, uh, we should remember, Levi'im are there to serve as role models. Uh, may God grant us such worthy role models among ourselves also. Amen.